Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, welcome to the closing session of the TNC 2007 conference. My name is Miroslav Milinovic. I'm uh, Vice President Conferences of Terena, and it's my great pleasure to chair this session today. Uh, at the very beginning, uh, a few of housekeeping announcements from the organizers, aside of the fact that we ask you to turn off your mobile phones and the sound on your PCs and um, uh, whatever equipment do you have. Uh, please uh, fill in the evaluation forms either on the paper or, uh, or uh, over the internet and uh, over the internet you were handed the secret code and probably you've guessed it um, up until now and um, you will be handed a little gift in exchange for your, for your help in making these conferences even better. Uh, I don't want to make further announcements about the housekeeping things. I think you have read all the things about the buses and uh, the way how to um, go from here. Our first keynote is Mr. Max Ebel from Google, Switzerland. And um, my first impression with Google is uh, my, my, my surroundings uh, are now more, less and less searching, more and more Googling. So we have added one more verb in, in, in our language. So in Croatian, we have Googling, although it's um, not a word, proper word. Uh, we look at the Google as a kind of example of the service that is robust enough and uh, is scalable enough to offer a decent service to us and also to our users. So without further delay, I'd like to announce and leave the floor to Mr. Max Ebel from Maximilian Ebel, actually, sorry, yeah. from Google to share a few of his and uh, their opinions and thoughts and results in this area. Oh. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah, well, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, uh, let me know if you can't hear me and then like make some signs so I can speak up. I'm mumbling sometimes. Um, so today I'm not really going to tell you anything about networking that you don't already know. Right? I mean, clearly everyone in this room knows more about networks than me. I'm not really a network person. What I'm going to do though is I'm trying to offer you a couple of glimpses into Google uh, infrastructure and show you what we built how we built it, why we built it that way, and how we can use it to, uh, for fun and for profit. So for the next 45 minutes, and it seems that the colors here are screwed up, I'm uh, giving you a behind the scenes look at the system's infrastructure, and you would actually normally see like a layered structure here with our products at the top, uh, the software infrastructure in the middle, and our um, computing platform at the bottom. And um, so both the Google file system or GFS and another technique I'll talk about some more map reduce is actually going to be uh, uh, focused on most. So oh, here we go. Great. So here you have the, the stack. Um, so before I actually start talking about products, let's see what is our mission. Our mission is to make all the world's information uh, to organize it and make it uh, universally accessible and useful. And how much information is out there? Well, frankly, we don't know, but we have a lower bound kind of, right? We know that the web has tens or, well, almost certainly hundreds of billions of documents at a 10 kilobytes a doc, that's hundreds of, of, of terabytes. There's everything else. There's email, there's personal files, there's databases, broadcast media, print, books, everything. And uh, at a 2003 study, there was an estimated five exabytes of data that is generated every year and growing at 30% every year. So per person, currently that's about 800 megabytes that is created per person per year, uh, most of it in magnetic media. And the web really is just a tiny portion of that. Um, so if you take our mission seriously, we have to really look at all these different uh, fonts, right? So there's um, the web, there's um, various document formats like Word, PowerPoint, OpenOffice, what, what not. Images, video, commercial data, ads, and shopping, enterprise, uh, internet data, news, email, scholarly publications, local information and yellow pages, maps, satellite images, instant messaging, uh, voice over IP, communities like awkward printed media, and so on. So the list basically does not stop here, but I ran out of space. Um, so 
products. What, what, is, what is a Google product? Well, we have, uh, we have web search, we have ads, we have uh, news search, perhaps. We have, uh, as I said, communities like Orkut. We now double in machine translation. So all of these products see uh, a continuing strong growth in their computational requirements, and that's along a multi multitude of axes. It's not only that we get more queries and more usage, but we also have more data to play with. We crawl a bigger portion of the web. The web itself is probably growing. And we also want to have better results, which means that we have to mine through our data more carefully to get more relevant results. Um, so therefore, what we need to build is a very large scale and high performance computing infrastructure that can deal with all this, uh, these tasks, right? So the hardware and software systems should make it really easy to build products, right? That's our goal. And additionally, we don't want to break the bank, so we want to focus on price and performance and the ease of use, so people can build uh, products fairly quickly. And this really helps us to build better products, right? Indices that contain more documents are generally more useful. If they are updated more often and you have more up-to-date results, if uh, you can serve uh, user queries faster, users are generally much happier, and you can have faster product development cycles. So um, in the next couple of minutes, I'm going to spend just a little bit of time on a computing platform that's at the bottom of the stack. Uh, uh, and here I just want to say a couple of words on cost efficiency, uh, our machine design, networking, and data center technology without going into any kind of detail. So our hardware design philosophy is really to prefer low-end servers and PC class designs, and then build lots and lots and lots of them, right? Why do we want to do that? Why not build like a really large, I don't want to name names, but some really large big iron supercomputer? Well, because even our smaller problems are really too big for one such computer, right? Uh, and then our large problems, they are usually easily partitioned into, into multiple tasks that can be easily run in parallel. Um, and in addition to that, if you build this really high power supercomputer, if you, if, you, if you just buy it off the shelf, it will ultimately still fail, right? I mean, it's not that it can't fail, right? So you have to build some sort of fault tolerance in your system anyway, right? Maybe you need to kind of build by two crates and then fail over. But you still have to actually deal with the failure. And if you deal with the failure, you might, well, uh, might as well do a really good job at it, and then you can all of a sudden run it on commodity components too. And it's actually quite interesting to build systems that are running on top of these commodity components. Uh, uh, GFS will be one part of that. So uh, just to have a couple of nice pictures here, um, this is how Google actually looked like in 1997. And you can see all these computers were basically uh, purloined from various other computer science um, de um, departments and professors. Uh, these were machines that were just not currently in use. And uh, Google actually ran quite well on that for a while. And of course, this didn't really scale. Um, and so our next machine generation looked a little bit more advanced. But if you took a closer look, it's still pretty horrible. Uh, so here you have um, on individual trays a piece of cork board about mm, yeah, maybe like three millimeters thick. You lay four uh, motherboards on top of that. These four motherboards would share one power supply, and they would all have standard fast Ethernet. And uh, on top of the uh, memory dims, you had a little plexiglass sheet, and on top of that, you would uh, stack two hard disks, which you can see in this in this picture over here. And uh, this was uh, this was an interesting system to work with because uh, it made it really hard to actually repair anything. Every time you actually tried to pull out one of these trays, first of all, you had to bring down four of your computers. They shared all one power supply. And uh, the likelihood was that by pulling out one tray, you would actually disconnect cables on the tray above it and below it. So um, most of these uh, racks actually stayed in, in use and would continually deteriorate until uh, at some point enough machines were dead that you, we would just kick the whole thing out. Uh, but they really never got quite repaired. So in 2000, we actually got a little bit better and more organized, and you see that uh, this looks uh, a little more cleaned up. We still had very innovative ways of cooling down uh, the machines. You see the fan here uh, in the background. Um, and then in 2001, we got actually a little bit better even. So here's a nice picture of the data center on a particular date. And three days later, it looked like this, and it had running machines in it, and these machines were actually serving web traffic. So by that time, uh, we got a much better the operational aspect of actually building large uh, bunches of machines. Our current design is an in-house rack design. Um, we still have PC class motherboards, nothing um, special. And uh, our storage and networking hardware is actually low-end and commodity as well. 
uh, operating systems we run is Linux and uh, a lot of in-house software on top of that. So that's basically all I want to say about our computing platform. Um, but I want to highlight two key challenges that we face. Uh, one of them is affordable high performance networking and the other one is the power inefficiency in the computing platforms uh, these days. Um, as for networking, the cost of provisioning gigabit ethernet networking at this point, and, and these numbers are I think a little bit out of date, so please bear with me, you know the real price currently better, is about $6 for like a single NIC. It's not really that expensive. If you want to put it on the motherboard, it's not expensive. But if you want to uh, connect the rack of 40 servers so that you have like a full cross connect at gigabit speed costs you already $50, $50 support. And what we really want is to take a Google cluster of thousands of servers and make sure that every server can talk to every other server at a gigabit full speed. And that is priceless. You can't really get that right now. Um, and we can see that there's a large gap in the cost efficiency improvements of the actual servers, the hardware, and the networking switches. And of course, the, uh, the answer is fairly simple. Uh, why is that? Because there's not a large market for customers that have such a large number of machines that all need to talk the speed. So while we are working on solutions that actually help us and don't break the bank, we can't really wait until they are out there. This might take a long time. So in the meantime, we need to deal with the bottlenecks for aggregate bandwidth. And uh, we do this typically by taking advantage of locality wherever that's possible. Right? So that's all I want to say about networking, I think. Um, as for power, um, the power situation is actually quite bad because it turns out that machines get more and more powerful, but um, since there's a push for more and more megahertz, the systems get also more and more power hungry. So if you look at the actual performance per watt, it actually stays fairly much straight, right? And with the uh, increase in power prices, um, the power bill for a machine over its lifetime uh, is becoming a fairly large portion of its total cost of ownership. And that is going to be a problem. So without going into details, we are actually working on, uh, with the chip manufacturers to promote power efficient design. So maybe it helps. It seems that lately uh, we get actually better perf uh, uh, watt per performance on some platforms. We also try to design our servers generally highly power efficient, in, in particular the power supplies. There's actually a lot of uh, work that uh, goes into that. There's a lot of power that's being wasted, in fact, at the power supply level. Um, and uh, finally, we also have several innovations in data center technology altogether. That's uh, efficient power distribution to the machines and uh, efficient cooling. Right? Cooling is also a very major uh, cost factor of the uh, power bill. So now let's actually focus on, on the actual um, meat of this talk, the Google file system. And uh, if I have time, I'll talk a little bit about two other abstractions that are very useful for us, uh, MapReduce and uh, Bigtable. So the Google file system, um, why do we need another file system? There's other file systems out there. Why not use one of them, right? Why use another disk-based file system, right? And the answer is that we have fairly unique requirements of, uh, uh, for, for a computing platform, right? For instance, we, most of our uh, operations need a huge read and write bandwidth, right? much more so than most other solutions can provide. We also need reliability not over like one or 10 nodes or like one big thing in a rack, but we need it over thousands of different nodes. Right? So um, then if you think of the file system as a distributed system, it also needs to be efficient. So we can't really afford to lose like 50, 60, 80 percent in, in overhead. Right? It needs to be efficient and also uh, what is uh, good for us, we mostly operate on lar large data blocks. So there's not a lot of very small files that we need to go over. Everything we, we do is based on large files, mostly. Um, we also have an unfair advantage over a general purpose file system. That is that we have complete control over all of our applications, all of our libraries, uh, in fact, the whole operating system, right? So um, how do we use GFS at Google? Is it just a phantom thing that we do? No, it's really deployed. We have 50 plus file system clusters, many of which have more than 1,000 machines. Uh, and each of these file system cells has pools of clients reading and writing to it. 
that can also exceed thousand uh, machines, right? So it's uh, it's a, a lot of machines, a lot of hardware, and the file systems themselves get very large. We have file systems that cross the one petabyte boundary, and uh, often we have read-write load uh, in excess of 10 gigabytes um, per second, uh, and that's uh, that's. Uh, all happening in the presence of uh, machines going down, networks going down, uh, networks coming back up, right? So that, that's really um, the special uh, thing that we need in our environment. Okay, so in the next couple of slides, I'll tell you a little bit about the requirements behind the Google file system. So what exactly do we need from the file system? And then I'll tell you a little bit about the architecture, and then I'll tell you a little bit about the implementation aspect. So. As for the requirements, what kind of applications do we have? Well, we have sort of three, roughly three major kind of applications. One, uh, performing huge batch operations over very large repositories. So let's assume you look at all the different uh, websites uh, and pages that we have found over the web, and we want to extract something from them. Maybe we want to build a link graph, or we want to extract all the uh, Danish pages or something like that. Um, so that means that we have to read through like a humongous amount of data and um, here we are really concerned mostly with bandwidth. The latency is not important at all as long as we kind of like get done by it in two days or something like that, right? Um, and uh, um, uh, availability is also not that important in that case. So if this uh, whole cluster goes down for like half a day, that's probably quite acceptable. Then we have other applications um, centered around workflow type applications. To give you an example, um, the Google News crawling system, for instance, continuously processes like new incoming news that we crawl and want to index and then serve to users um, as snippets. And this crawling part clearly cannot go down for a day, right? Because then we would not have like any new news to show to the users, so that's bad. And uh, so the availability must be generally higher. And the bandwidth requirement is typically still fairly high, but not as high as for large. <coughs> Uh, uh, scans of repositories. And then finally, we have serving tasks, and if you want to serve uh, user traffic, then, uh, well, what's really important is low latency. The user should never wait for more than 300 milliseconds, basically, right? Um, so you probably have a lot of seeks on disk, for instance, and uh, the availability is really, really important. You cannot just go down. If google.com just goes down, we are very unhappy. and. Um, uh, that's just not not acceptable. So what API did we choose? Well, we could have used basically POSIX. Uh, we didn't actually do that. We did choose the familiar file system interface that you know from Unix, so we have open, close, read, write, uh, et cetera. But we didn't really need to strictly adhere to the POSIX standard. Uh, first of all, uh, in our environment, we have control over what's going on. Uh, also, we having the, uh, the freedom to explore uh, slightly more fuzzy designs allows us to explore also alternate semantics, more asynchronous operation, for instance, or um, uh, batch operations, uh, are, uh, allowing us to, to really optimize the system much more. And the uh, actual API is really implemented as a client library and not through system calls, mostly because there's really no good reason. So the extra performance we would get out of that is is not helping us, mostly because our real bottleneck is, again, the intercluster uh, bandwidth constraint that we have, right? So um, it's almost never inside the machine. What kind of data formats do we have? Interestingly enough, we have mostly two different data formats. One is a record I.O. data format. It's a record I.O. file that contains just a sequence of records that can be variable sized. And typically, you have processes that append records to like a file over and over again, and then you have other processes reading that, sort of uh, using it as a log, log file. Um, the second data format that is uh, prevalent is the sorted string table, or SS table, and uh, an SS table is really just a data structure that holds a sorted sequence of key value pairs, where key and value are basically string types in C++. Um, the SS table contains an index, so you can fairly uh, easily find out the particular part of your um, uh, of, your, of your file. If you want look for a specific key, it's very easy. You need to look it up in the index, and then you need one disk seek. Um, on the other hand, the SS table is immutable. Once you have built it, well, that's it. You have to rebuild it with new data in it if you want to add something. Um, both these formats include uh, internal checksums and uh, support for compression. Um, both is actually very common in the 
we wanted to make that part of the client library so that people don't have to do it over again. Um, our access patterns um, for write, um, mostly append only. Um, there's very few processes that really need to do update in place. So typically we kind of rewrite all of our data structures uh, if you need to. Um, we encourage very much to have a single writer profile and we discourage very much that we have multiple concurrent writers. So if you have multiple writers appending to the same file, uh, this makes, uh, um, this, this poses all kinds of problems that we can solve, but at a price. And we would much rather have uh, only one writer per file. For reads, um, most of the reads that we see are sequential scans or t um, similar to tail the end of a record or file. If you treat it as a log, then you have a consumer of that log and that consumer will basically tail the end of the record or file. And we have random small reads in SS tables. Maybe if you want to surf from GFS and you have queries that want to um, yeah, know the value of a particular uh, key in an SS table. Then you would do that. Um, so after all these requirements, I can finally show you uh, how the GFS architecture looks like. So you see that um, you have um, um, a master component uh, that can be replicated. You have chunk servers that are also replicated and you have a bunch of clients on the right side. Now, uh, files are broken up into chunks and typically chunk size is 64 megabytes. Chunks can be smaller. If you have a very small file, it doesn't actually extend past the file size, but uh, they are limited at 64 megabytes, so files then are, contain multiple chunks. Um, the data transfer happens between the clients and the chunk servers directly, so the master is not involved in actual data transfer. The, the master, in fact, only deals with metadata, right, and that is the one abstraction that really helps us to, to speed up um, the process. So let me go back one slide. So there's another thing you can see here. Um, you see that, say, for instance, these are all the chunks for a particular file, right, C0 through C4, and you see that some of these chunks appear in more than one chunk server, and that's actually what we want. This is replication, so that means that if any single chunk server kind of disappears or explodes or something goes wrong with it, there's other chunk servers that still have this data. And <clears throat> I'll talk a little bit about how the master will actually um, help to maintain the property that uh, chunks are really scattered all over the place and you have enough of them. So what does the master do in detail? Um, first, it maintains the file namespace. So it deals with creations, deletions, renames. Uh, it is able to give you the matching files if you give it a pattern. Uh, you can, it can do a stats, it can do snapshots of files. Uh, it also maps files into chunks. So if you want to write to a particular place in a particular chunk, the master will tell you where does this chunk live, which chunk server actually has the copies. Um, also, the master monitors the state of chunk servers. So if chunk servers fail, eventually the master will find out, oh, this chunk server is bad. I need to take evasive action and make uh, chunks move uh, to some other servers. Um, uh, it also knows about how full chunk servers are, so you can provide some load balancing, so every chunk server gets roughly the same amount of, of disk, especially if you add chunk servers to an existing GFS uh, uh, cell. Um, it can also initiate a recovery, I, as I just said that, and it can garbage collect dead chunks. So when you delete a file, for instance, all the chunks, now uh, we keep them for a while, we have a lifetime of deleted files, and when this lifetime expires, the chunks are actually getting deleted. Uh, and in addition to that, we display stats and provide administrative functions. So that's what the master does. Now the chunk server, the chunk server really exposes the local disk that it runs um, in the form of chunks uh, to the outside world, right? So the interface to read and write chunks is in between a block and a file interface. Um, each chunk is identified by a handle, which is a 64-bit integer. And uh, as I said, it can be variable size up to its maximum of 64 megabyte. Um, chunks can be created and destroyed on the GFS on the chunk server, and um, the clients can um, read and write byte ranges within the chunk. So you don't have to read the whole chunk at, in, in one go, but you can actually say I want to kind of access this particular byte range. <clears throat> Uh, and uh, the chunk servers also have their own support for replication in that um, there's uh, one primary chunk server assigned by the master for every chunk, and all writes to this chunk server will have to go through the primary first, and then that primary will sequentialize all the other writes to the copies of the chunks that we want to make. 
Um, similarly, the chunk server also has support for reconstruction. If the master wants to tell a brand new chunk server to say, hey, take over this particular chunk from this other chunk server that just fell down, um, it can do that as well. Um, uh, from the client side, as I said, it's, uh, the protocol is implemented by a client library. The meta uh, operations, uh, operations on metadata go to the master, operations on data go to the client. Um, most of the most of the, the errors and uh, exceptional conditions will be hidden from the user, right? For instance, if a chunk server is, is down, well, the uh, client library will try for a while, then it will ask the master again, then it will uh, try again, and it can try a long time before the user sees that actually anything is wrong. Um, the reason why we do this is that the, 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 the actual implementation is relatively complex, given that there are so many different parts in the system, and exposing all that to the user is, is most likely not going to be beneficial. Then people have to know about, about this. Uh, in GFS, people really don't have to know too many technical details. Um, particularly the read protocol, uh, just to give you an idea how this works in, in, in detail, uh, the client will ask the master for the chunk location. So I said, I want to read byte 10 of this file. So then you find byte 10 is in chunk zero. So go to the master and say, for this file, where does chunk zero live? And it will say, oh, it lives on machine XYZ123. And then you actually go and ask machine XYZ123, give me these 10 bytes, please. Um, now, if there's an error, the ch we will try another chunk server. The master will give maybe like a list of chunk servers, right? And um, if that doesn't work for a long time, we'll eventually re uh, uh, query the master and see if maybe the chunks have moved uh, to some other place in the meantime, right? And then we'll try this again. Uh, also, we cache information on where chunks live so that uh, you don't have to ask the master for everything every five seconds. Uh, the master, as we see, will scale quite a bit, but uh, only to thousands of operations per second, not millions. Um, so the biggest uh, challenge, of course, like with any other distributed systems, is fault tolerance, right? And clearly, there's many things that can go wrong here. Disks can go wrong, machines can go wrong, like power supplies, memory, and so on. The network can go wrong, sometimes in very interesting ways, uh, like creating uh, data um, packet loss on only one part of the link on one blade of a switch, and it's kind of like hard to kind of find this out. Uh, and then there can always be software bugs. And uh, combinations of that are particularly tough to debug because they are not so easy to test for. Um, in our case, failures are actually fairly frequent because we have commodity hardware that's not particularly designed for fault tolerance and also because we don't have like only like 100 machines but we have like thousands, right? So um, uh, what we try to do here is to check some often and early to detect errors and we use replication in case things do go wrong then we can actually reconstruct from uh, from a state that is still available. So how does replication work? Um, there's two different ways. The uh, easy way is to just replicate three times everything, right? Um, and uh, you can specify that you want to uh, replicate on more than three chunk servers if you want to. That's sometimes useful if you have a file that you know is going to be read a lot and then you just replicate this one file on, say, 10 or 20 machines, and that means that a 1,000 machines can actually kind of load this file fairly quickly. Um, uh, also, the chunks are replicated across racks because sometimes, like, a whole switch will go down, and then where do you go if all your chunks are on this one rack? So that's important. We have uh, additionally support for Reed Solomon encoding, um, and currently we have only limited uh, experience in production. We only use it for data that is only going to be read, so um, we have a method that will transmute a file with uh, uh, triple replication into a, a Reed Solomon encoded file. And uh, from then on, you cannot write to this file anymore. Um, so how does recovery work? Well, let's assume this um, chunk server here in the middle uh, goes bad, uh, goes completely uh, from the network. You can't reach it anymore. Now what the master uh, can do, it can take all the replicas of this particular chunk that are on the other machines and nicely spread out uh, and uh, create reconstruction requests for them with other chunk servers, right? So the nice thing about this is that all these chunks uh, live on, on a very large number of machines. So if you want to replicate all of them at the same time, you can use your full cluster bandwidth, 
right? I mean, you don't kind of replicate it only of, of one machine only, right? So this is nice because it reduces your, uh, your window of vulnerability, right? I mean, it's, um, it takes much shorter time until you are completely recovered, and it spreads the recovery load over multiple <coughs> machines. Uh, for Reed Solomon, this is more complicated, and you also need more bandwidth, right? So that makes it harder. Um, so how does it work in, uh, in detail? The master needs to kind of first find out something is wrong. It can do that by first monitoring the chunk server itself, or maybe the client libraries will actually tell the master, hey, I can't reach this, I can't reach this node, I can't reach this node, right? This could be also a network problem. Um, and then for each under-replicated chunk, the master will select the source and destination chunk servers, send a reconstruction request to the destination, and from then on, the destination chunk server is actually responsible to uh, migrate the data. Again, the, the master is not dealing with any data transfers itself. Um, yeah, data consistency, always a problem. Um, we have solved this by um, designing, a, a, a designating a primary chunk server for every chunk, and then all mutates, all writes to a particular chunk uh, now have to go through this primary chunk server that will then serialize it to all the other chunk servers that it needs to replicate to. Um, as long as mutates are successful, that means that uh, all the replicas are uh, consistent. If a mutate has failed, there might be inconsistencies for a while, but if the client retries, typically that fixes the problem, unless the client also dies, which can happen. And uh, then the master will have to notice that and fix the problem, which will also work, but takes a little longer. And of course, data inconsistencies can be a problem, right? Applications don't really like if their uh, state flips back and forth, right? And they like to rely on, uh, uh, you know, things being somewhat stable and committed. Um, applications can work around it. For instance, the record I/O data structure that I talked about can tolerate inconsistent state to some degree. Um, Okay, I have talked about chunk replication. I want to talk a little bit about master replication. So the GFS master right now is a single program, a single process, and um, if that fails, the whole GFS cell goes down. You don't want that. So therefore, we have now a primary master and we have a bunch of shadow masters. The primary master handles all the mutation to the master state and it replicates its own transaction log to all the shadows. Uh, uh, in addition, we use an external log service to uh, hold kind of a primary election. So at any time you know who is the primary, who are the shadows. And when you fail over, you again select the new primary and you synchronize with all your replicas on startup. So you know that everyone starts with the same uh, state. And this takes sometimes quite a while, minutes, although we would prefer it to be seconds. But yeah. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about the implementation. Uh, all of our servers are user-level processes. Uh, this is nice because it's easier to develop, debug, and deploy. And as I said earlier, that the performance is really limited by the cluster network um, bandwidth and not so much by the individual machines, so uh, that's fine with us. And since fault-tolerant systems hi hide bugs and some sometimes things can go wrong for days without noticing because the system kind of works around it, right? We really like to uh, go overboard with, with logging and uh, statistics. So we log every single RPC to all of our chunk servers and masters and keep this uh, about four day. I mean, that depends on how much local disk you want to allocate for that. And it's really incredibly useful for debugging because very often you get a bug report only like half a day after bad things happened. Uh, and these are uh, all production systems, so you cannot shut them down and kind of like debug them uh, in a, in, in, as a post modem or so. Um, and the machines, uh, all the processes, the, ser the chunk servers and the master provide a lot of stats that you can either uh, download in a machine readable form, which our monitoring system does, and it also has an HTML interface so you can basically interactively click and browse through, uh, uh, through, your, um, through your state. So you look at histograms of all of our stats over the last minute, hour total, so this is sometimes pretty nice to see a graphical representation. Uh, and we keep online samples of different latency buckets. So if you see that, for instance, all the requests that have high latency come from a particular rack, that's a pretty good indication that maybe something with a switch there is, is, is wrong. Um, for the master, as I said, it's a single replicated server. Um, that decision greatly simplified our design and implementation, but it has some limitations. All the state in the master is kept in memory. Um, this is good because it handles, uh, to, uh, allows us to handle thousands of operations a second. Um, and the log is persistently uh, stored to disk and occasionally compacted. Um, yeah, but four gigabyte of memory can 
only support ten, uh, tens of millions of files uh, and about a petter, petabyte of user space if you use 64 megabyte chunks. And that sounds like it's, it's a lot, but it's puny. It's not large enough, not by far. So um, for the chunk server, um, chunk servers are fairly simple. Um, they map chunks on the underlying file system. So each chunk basically is a file in a, in, in a Linux file system. And they are lazily allocated as they grow up to their 64 megabyte mark. And the uh, chunk server will make sure that they don't grow beyond that. Um, performance is good enough, so we didn't have to optimize this very hard. There's transaction logs for in-flight writes that go to other uh, replicas. And we keep chunk sums for blocks of data. And uh, we commit a particular write as soon as uh, the data has arrived at all three chunk servers. Then we actually go and write it to disk. So that helps us to limit the amount of dirty uh, space on a, on a machine. OK, so that's pretty much all I wanted to tell about the, the, um, the file system. Uh, for future directions, as I said, tens of millions of files and a petabyte of user storage is great, but it's not nearly great enough. We want to kind of have this much larger. So decentralized master is the bottleneck at this point. Uh, it really limits the size of the system. And we have applications that really overload the master, where we have to split up our user space into four different shards and then write to four different GFS cells. But it's really annoying. Uh, so we are currently designing a new distributed master that should scale by another two or three orders of magnitude. And it's based on our experience with, uh, with Bigtable, um, which is the Google database, if you want. I don't think I have time to go into detail of that today. But what I want to do next is to talk a little bit about uh, MapReduce. And MapReduce is a um, programming model that uh, allows us to uh, simplify large-scale computations on, on very large clusters. So here's now something that we want to do with GFS, on top of GFS, um, that makes it really easy to build new products, which is what I talked about earlier. Um, so the idea is that you split up your computation into two parts. A map part that takes your input file and creates uh, and extracts the useful information out of that. And then in the reduce phase, you want to take this extracted information and combine it to an output. So that sounds pretty vague. Um, so let me uh, give you an example in one more slide. But I'll just tell you why this is a good thing. Uh, it's good because it's pretty fast. Most of the work that needs to be done to actually run such a computation happens in a library that will take care of all the messy things, like uh, optimizing for locality, optimizing sorting, lots of tuning work that goes on. Also, the library handles all the machine failures and deals with data corruption and stuff, so it's fairly robust. It's pretty easy to use because you only have to write two functions, a map and a reduce function, and it's scalable by design. So you can run it on like 10 machines, you can run it on Thousand machines, no problem. Um, it's also, and this is actually the surprising thing, it's pretty widely applicable. You can solve a broad range of problems. And it comes with its own monitoring page counters. So here's a couple of uses inside of Google to help you understand why this is actually pretty broad, broadly usable. Ads uses it, Maps uses it, Local uses it, News uses it, Google Print uses it, our machine translation uses it, our logs analysis. Uh, search quality, spelling, web search indexing, the act of building our search, search indices, they are all heavily built on top of map reductions. Um, here's an idea of how many jobs we had. This is pretty old. In 2005, we had 72,000 different map reduction jobs, um, totally using about a machine millennium, 358,000 days. And um, you see that the, uh, the average number of worker machines was about 230. And you see the um, average worker depth per job was 1.9. So you can see that at this scale, you can almost, certain, almost be certain that something actually dies and goes bad. So you, know, you really don't want to deal with this case yourself for every single application that you have. Um, so I don't know how much time I have. You have 10 more minutes? Yeah. OK, I'll try to kind of go through this. So here's an example. Let's assume you have a large uh, set of um, documents that you have crawled from the web. And you want to count how many, what's the word frequency that you observe. Mm -hmm. So you need to specify a map and a reduce function. Now, it, this is like a very simple example. So the map function will take a key value pair. 
Now the key and the value would be the URL and the document text. This is pretty much what comes back from our uh, crawling engine if you want. And the output here is, is very simple. I'll take every word in my text document and I output this word one for every single word that I see, right? So if I have only one single document, uh, this particular URL from Hamlet, and the text is just to be or not to be, then I would output two and one, B and one, or and one, not and one, two and one, B and one, right? So I would output in total six tuples. And now in the reduce phase, I would um, take again as an input uh, a key, which would be the word, and not a single value, but all the values that the map phase, ha phase, phase has created, right? So in this case, for, for, the, for the key B, it would be two times the value one, because B has occurred twice in the input, right? So the magic that goes on here is that the uh, intermediate phase between map and reduce is completely independent of the actual application and has already done the work for you, like rearranging all the values for each particular key that you're interested in, right? So the, the reduce will basically just like see the number of values that it has and just add them up, right? So B will be one, not will be one, or will be one, and two will be two. So that's it, right? And then the output is basically uh, paired with the key and saved. So that's what map reduction is. It runs on GFS, uh, like described here. So we have a master, the map reduce master, that will fork off a whole bunch of map tasks and a whole bunch of reduce fast tasks. The map tasks will read a bunch of GFS files, uh, apply the map function to all of them, and then write the uh, intermediate output to a shuffle phase. And the shuffle phase will basically just resort everything and make sure that all the keys, uh, all the values for particular keys end up on the same machine, which can now uh, then be read by the reduce phase. And that will combine all the keys and write the output to GFS. Now, there's a couple of nice things about that. So one is, let me see if I can actually go back. Um, one thing is that if you think about the GFS chunks here, you can basically make, make it so that each map task will only read one GFS chunk at a time. Once we have that, then all of a sudden, this map task can actually execute on the same machine on which this chunk resides, right? So all of a sudden, your read becomes a local read from disk. It doesn't actually traverse the network anymore, right? So that's actually a very nice uh, optimization that you really don't want to do yourself but the library provides that for you automatically. And um, just really to go quickly through an example, this is a screenshot of an actual map reduction that builds part of our index. You see it has an input of um, about 900 gigabytes. It has started to map. There's uh, the three map phases in the uh, upper left corner. Um, and then I kind of fast scroll through this. So after a while, you see that you have mapped a little bit more. So the green bar here goes up on all the different 500 machines that you run your map reduction on. And then you see that there's a red uh, number of red bars that are following up, and that's the shuffle phase in operation. And so as time goes by, you map more, you shuffle more, and at some point, you're completely done with shuffling and with mapping, and then you can start with the reduction phase. And you see that's the blue bar that starts there. And so as time goes by, you see that you finally uh, finish with the map reduction. So I said already that um, under the cover, we deal with locality. The shuffle phase itself is pretty much a, a sort which, uh, uh, which we have optimized um, a lot. The shuffle stage itself is pipelined with the mapping, right? That's, why that's always possible. And um, we also choose many more tasks than machines. So we didn't use 50, uh, 500 tasks. If we had 500 machines, we would actually use you know, 500,000 tasks or whatever. Just uh, the idea behind that is that for load balancing, if a particular machine is really slow, it basically gets stuck with a tiny portion and works on that for a while, while everyone else can actually make a lot of progress. That reduces the amount of stragglers. Uh, we also like to avoid stragglers as far as possible by, towards the end of the computation, start up backup executions of the remaining tasks. So if there's like one guy that will take like two hours to do the last two bytes, you have started another copy of that task in the meantime. And if this guy is done faster, then you are done earlier. So that's pretty cool. Of course, if tasks fail, it's really easy to restart those tasks in this kind of framework. Um, so here's a couple of data points. We grabbed once over one terabyte in 100 seconds on 1,800 machines, and we can sort 
a terabyte of 100 byte records in about 14 minutes, which is kind of nice. So in summary, it's actually a pretty useful abstraction, and it really simplifies large scale computations at Google. As long as you can map your problem into a MapReduce, it's extremely easy to run it in our infrastructure. Um, yeah, it's also fun to use, and let's the library deal with all the messy details. There's um, publications on that. I put the link here if you want to look it up. It's on labs.google.com. Um, and then in the last like two minutes, I'll, I think I'll actually skip uh, most of it, but I just wanted to show you this one slide. It's kind of fun. It shows you kind of query frequency over time uh, for some queries over about a year and a half. Uh, so the first query is Eclipse, and you can see there's like three distinct spikes and you can guess whether that's actually cars or lunar or solar eclipses, it's actually uh, both of them. And then if you look for a full moon, you see, well, there's a lot more queries on full moon days. And if you look at watermelons, you see that watermelons are much more popular in summer. Well, that's not very surprising, but it's kind of nice to kind of like see the system work, right? And you can also look at like World Series and Summer Olympics and stuff like that. So I think for time reasons, I'll skip most of that and just uh, have a summary. Uh, and for us, we think that behind all of our services are a lot of challenging technical problems, right? As hardware networking, distributed systems, fault tolerance, data structures, algorithms, machine learning, all this stuff, right? And the right hardware and software infrastructure that I have described today, or part of which I have described today, really matters tremendously. Because if you have that in place, if you have a file system that is performing, and if you have something like MapReduce that makes it very easy to do a large-scale computation, then even small teams can make a huge, can, can achieve huge things in a short amount of time. And I think that's really what's very important to us. And uh, that's it. I'll, uh, uh, if you have any questions, now is a good time, and I'll stick around a little bit after the talk as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Max, for the nice talk. And um, we have a time for some questions, so please take a mic. Good morning, Kamran Zakon from the Belgian government. So during your talk, you presented the file system. But in order to have a, a, an, eff an efficient system, we need also efficient communication technologies between the CPU and the I.O. nodes. So mm -hmm. do you use, for instance, InfiniBand, which enables multi-gig communication between those, those elements, or you invented your own because this one was not so... Uh, yeah, so I think the question was whether we actually use like specialized like networking uh, to make uh, to to optimize single systems more, and I think the answer is that we don't really need to. We use fairly standard uh, uh, Ethernet systems, really. Um, that's good enough for us because we have more machines than we have a backbone network for. So at an individual machine level, we are actually fine getting you know 50 percent or 80 percent out of a gigabit link. That that's that's okay. Um, uh, this might change over time, I don't know, but when right now, uh, really, our bottleneck is actually on the network backbone, right? So uh, on the other hand, um, I'm also involved in doing backups from GFS, and we can actually download files from GFS to a single machine uh, onto a fiber channel card uh, at, I think, 70 megabytes a second. So that's, that's fairly good performance. So getting another, like, 20, 30% wouldn't really achieve that much in the big scheme of things. Thank you. Am I on? Um, here. <laughs> Stuart, stand up. Hi. Um, your worry about power consumption mm -hmm. and the way that the file system chunks works ought to indicate that you could place chunks that are rarely read on, on the same servers and you should be able to power down those servers uh, at will and just have the master power them up again once they need it. Is that something you're looking into? Uh, yeah, I think this is an interesting question. If you have uh, chunks that you know you're not going to use, can you do something more efficient with them than basically keeping them on a spinning disk, right? And the answer is that um, this is something we are looking into, right? There are actually commercial solutions that uh, work, like uh, that, that use disk as a tape library, right? You basically stream things on it and uh, the 
this disk-based tape library will spin disks down as soon as they can. Uh, but you can also use tape uh, as such, right? If you know that the file is not going to be used. Uh, I think the, diff the tricky question is to know whether or not this file is actually going to be used in the future. And this is an interesting question because if you run uh, a file system as a service, right, you don't really know exactly what your users are up to, right? So it's sometimes hard to make this decision uh, uh, efficiently. And of course, uh, storing chunks on, on disk that you can rapidly speed up again is, is, is going to be much faster to recover from than putting things on tape. Yeah, but I think the, the, the short answer is this is an interesting thing and uh, something that uh, one should look into, yeah. yeah. Okay, I have a question about, uh, if I go on your web interface, I mean the uh, Google, uh, I usually go to somewhere, not directly to US. I go, from me it's the three milliseconds and the mm -hmm. from US it's the few milliseconds from them also. So do you re replicate this uh, file system also into Europe or other countries or uh, you still using just uh, the web server as a uh, communication unit which is connecting with the, with the file system which is located in somewhere in, in uh, okay eBay. Um, yeah so I think the the uh, the answer really is um, that we we have more we have data centers outside the US right and if we can we like to serve user requests as fast as possible right and uh, often it seems suboptimal to have um, just the front end in one place and then reroute do uh, reroute the query somewhere else do all the work say in the US and then reroute it back, uh, right? Um, so I think it depends on the locale where you are, right? Um, I'm not sure if we have data centers in every single country, right? And how we exactly route it, but we do have data centers in multiple places and we have uh, GFS file system clusters in multiple places. And uh, it's not necessarily the case that everything that you see serving is actually serving from GFS. Often it's also more convenient to serve directly from local disk. Um, since a lot of, uh, of us are struggling with, with storage and replication, etc., cetera, um, do you have any plans to, to do something like Amazon does with this S3 file system where you offer a web services interface to storage that Google offers? Um, uh, honestly, I don't know. I mean, it would certainly be a possibility, um, but I, I don't know what the product plans are. Uh, any more questions? Okay, if not, let me once again thank the, our team of people. <laughs> and yes, it's now my pleasure and uh, kind of duty to, to say a few words at the end of the conference. Let me remind you first, we are here or not here, but uh, we gathered together at the Torena Networking Conference, and we, 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 we see them as the main opportunity, main annual opportunity for discussions within our community, and these discussions always mean the exchange of, or exchange of information, ideas, um, and um, collaboration work between the uh, members of the community. This year we were in Lingby, I hope I pronounced it near the quality expected. Uh, conferences organized, as you know, by Terena, and um, thank to our host, UNIC, and the support from DTU with local support provided by ICS. As usual, people have a view on the program and so on. I will share a few thoughts on that, but let me first start with the things that are kind of not seen. First, you know, we have a, not the electrified chairs, but rather, um, <laughs> Outlet enabled, electric outlet enabled chairs. Yeah? Uh, this is kind of, th th this has become a kind of tradition. Last year in Catania, we had a different system here. It's, a, it's also something like a challenge for the electricians uh, uh, and technicians to, to, to make this possible. Although there is no, there is no uh, network connection uh, enabled chair, and you would guess why. Um, 
we do have a very good service, uh, streaming service, and I will provide a few statistical numbers about what we had. And yes, the reason for for not having the um, Ethernet plug-in was the edge room. And uh, I must say, this is the first conference I have seen this this logo, and I hope uh, it is definitely not the last one. Uh, some uh, statistics: we have a around 470 uh, participants. And now, uh, on top of that, we had a maximum of uh, 107 users who were watching streaming simultaneously at some point of a time. Actually, uh, 590 in total until this very morning, and I think that the number is being higher, and uh, 70 in average. Uh, about the wireless connections, you see that it seems like every fourth of you is an uh, edge roomer, and that is a good thing for the edge room, hopefully. Next year we will have a higher figures. About the program, yeah, the title was Visible Services and Transparent Networks as the Program Committee decides. Well, 106 speakers in four plenaries, three, 32 sessions, uh, number of site meetings, workshops, and both, and it's my opinion that it was a, a quite a large program, and I hope you, everybody of you could find something of interest. The topics included actually some of these, but also program evolved in its own way, and um, you know, at the very beginning, uh, now I have to say one thing. I borrowed some slides from our keynotes, my apologies, but you know, that was the opportunity, so I have done it. <laughs> uh, at the very beginning, we learned that Okay, we are living on our planet, and uh, it has some oceans, and uh, we are the users of this ocean, at least me, from time to time. And um, <clears throat> there are some things underneath that, 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 that they are cute and important, and we don't appreciate them so much. But on the other hand, our users also don't appreciate some pictures like this. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> you would see they are quite similar ones. So we exchange routers for algae and some way. And um, as a final thought on the program, yeah, do we have a global network? Is it our planet and our network or just the distributed systems? And yeah, I think it's up to us to, to, to make it uh, more unique and more global than it is and work on policies and other stuff that, that are on top of the technological solutions that we are aware of. For all of these good things in the program, the credit goes, of course, to the program committee chaired by Thomas Schmidt from Germany. So please, let's again thank them for their good work. <laughs> Although they do have to finish the work, at least they have to finish two publications uh, that are supposed to come out in, in this year. Furthermore, I have some more people to thank because on top of the good program comes the excellent organization. Great thanks to our uh, hosts from UNIC, first Martin Beck, and then I would like to invite some people to come here, some ladies actually, to get the flowers. First, Gite Julin Kutsk. Gite, are you here? Remarkable work in a 
technical support, Thomas Dano from DTU and Torkel Janssen from Unity. Our special thanks also goes to Lone Westman, Annette Grimm, and all the other people from the UNIC and the local staff who were there when we needed them. So guys and girls, thank you very much again. Uh, of course, if Terena organizes things, you have to say thank you to some people from the Terena. And um, I do want to thank to all the members of Terena staff at the very beginning, but I would like to pick out Bertrand Pixteren for his regular and remarkable work on Terena Jim for being there whenever he was needed and fixing things as much as he, as he could. And of course, last but not the least, Carol de Grot for uh, all the work she has done. Many thanks goes also to our sponsors, to our main sponsor, Cisco Systems, and the others, Siena, Juniper Networks, Global Crossing, Alcatel Lucent, Global Sign, Extreme, Level 3, Google Sun, Adva, Nortel, Forest, and Arkena, of course, again, DTU and UNIC. I'd like to extend my thanks to the speakers and session chairs for their time and their preparations and uh, sharing the information with us. Special thanks to our plenary speakers, Catherine Richardson, Kevin Almerot, <coughs> June Murai, Claudia Nathanson, Othan Herzog, and Max Siebel. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> and last but not the least, to all of you conference participants, because without you, there wouldn't be a conference. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a very quick announcement right now, and this goes with the Nordonet, so if somebody wants to come out and... Uh... Say a few words about it. Say a minute word about it. Thank you. I am Janne Kanner, working for Funet, the Enren in Finland. And I'm sure I will see all of you at the next Terena conference, but before that, there is another great opportunity to get together because Funet and Nordnet are arranging the next 24th Nordnet conference, and that will be held in, in Finland, in Espo, that is in the Helsinki area, and, and it will be held in, in next April. Finland should be really nice uh, time in the, in the spring, so I would like to warmly welcome all of you to, to join us in Finland, and until then, we'll see. Thank you. Yeah, of course, after we closed uh, 2007, we, we, we aim to 2008. And um, I'd like to share with you the information about the program committee in 2008. It will be chaired by Mr. Diego Lopez from Red Iris, Spain, and uh, with a number of people. Oh, we hope we will have a decent program for you, and uh, it will be nice and interesting, and you would be interesting to come again. And. Um, now I think it's a perfect time to announce that the next TNC will be in Bruges, in Belgium, uh, in May 2008, and I would like to invite Mr. Pierre Breuer from Belnet to say a few words. Thank you. We have some slides, so we can leave. No, no, it's Dear colleagues and friends, I'm delighted to announce that Belnet 
the Belgium Research and Education Network, will be hosting the next Terena conference. And what better place to host it than in a very beautiful city of Bruges? I'm sure you know it. It's quite rightly called the Venice of the North, and I'm sure you, you will all agree. We want to make the next conference a truly unforgettable experience, since Belnet will be celebrating its 15th anniversary. There is another reason why we will be celebrating next year. In 2008, Belnet will have its own all optical network ready. The beautiful canals of Bruges form an amazing network within the city, in a kind of, they symbolized perfectly what Terena does, networking the networkers. We believe that this great historic site is the perfect spot to turn the next Terena conference into a very successful international forum of collaboration, innovation, and knowledge sharing. Some of you may be aware that Bruges Inner City is an official UNESCO World Heritage Site. Not only that, it's right in the center of Bruges that we will be welcoming you next year. The Congress Center, once a medieval hospital, has been beautifully restored and is located in a picturesque inner garden. Although the city center hotels are all within walking distance, I said walking, <laughs> of the Congress venue, I advise you to book early because Bruges can get pretty busy on that period of time. Our Danish colleagues have done a great job this year and they have been a very perfect host. Thank you, Copenhagen, for a wonderful conference. Let's hope our conference in Belgium goes as well as yours. And who knows, maybe even better. We will try to. <laughs> so don't miss this great opportunity. Uh, suppose you have seen, to whet your appetite, we have put some delicious Belgian chocolates on your chair. So don't sit on them. Eat them. Don't forget to pick them up. And certainly, don't forget to come to Bruges. I'm sure you won't. But before you rush off, I know the, that you want to go home, but we have got something we are like to show you. And no. Next year, the TNC convention will take you to a place so advanced in its ways, it will never cease to amaze you. Let's walk in Bruges. Let's take a step into the future. Well, um, maybe not so new. Ah, there we go. It's no coincidence, you're one of the UNESCO's World Heritage Sites. Your beauty blinds me. An 11th century city, a place where old and you walk hand in hand. Bruges, you are a city with an old soul, but with a new young heart. Venice of the North. You are the perfect place to fall in love. Boat rides, horse rides, beautiful places everywhere you look. And of course, you are known for your beautiful round burr, uh, 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 beer, beer, beer. Mm. Belgium is home to some of the world's finest beers. If you're on a diet, Bruges is not the best place to go. In Bruges, we live life to the fullest. 
Rouge, you have it all. The best chocolate in the world, the most romantic sights a person could dream of, and all the technological toys to make you the perfect playground for the 2008 TNC convention. Oh, Brooge, I love you so. See you next year. Goodbye. Okay, thank you. And uh, I hope I will see all of you next year in Bruges. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, we are closed. And um, thank you very much for your attention and being here. Have a safe trip home or continue with the off-topic meetings and so on. Bye-bye.